forward to this. Uh, we're going to be um, we're going to be waiting for uh, we don't have we're going to be waiting for Tomaz who's uh, with Hyperledger and he's our lead at Hyperledger and uh, he's going to be live streaming this on uh, YouTube as well it's going to be recorded on YouTube on the Hyperledger. YouTube channel. Fantastic. So let's take a, we'll just wait a few more minutes here and see what, uh, see who shows up. Lots of, uh, lots of people participate after the fact that get into uh, the recordings of these. Yeah. So there mm -hmm. is, yeah, you know, it's, uh, I think the, um, with Zoom, you get invited to 1,400 different Zooms a day, and if you if you if you had to attend every one you were invited to, you probably wouldn't have a chance to do anything. Right. No lunch, no dinner, no breakfast. So yes, uh, yes, it's yeah. But you have so having the ability to to record them on video is uh, is pretty awesome. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Sioban Porkis. Is it, did we pronounce that correctly? Uh, it's Siobhan. It's oh, like a very Siobhan. Irish Irish oh, name. Very yeah. nice. Are you in Ireland now? No, I'm in Canada, actually. Okay. I'm in Ontario. Uh, I'm not Irish. My mom oh. just likes the name. Oh, your mother. Oh, very nice. Very nice. <laughs> Where are yeah. you in Ontario? Where are you in Ontario? What area, if you don't mind me asking? Um, I'm a couple hours north of Toronto. Okay. Just kind of close to Muskoka's. Okay, good, good, good. I'm okay. in the calling. I'm in the Collingwood area. Oh, great! Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm well. like right by Barry. You're by Barry. Okay, okay. I'm just uh, we're in Thornberry here, just north of, uh, just north of uh, Collingwood. A few minutes. Oh yeah, oh, I know Thornberry. Oh, oh nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice to meet you. Nice could to you meet you. Could you could you pronounce your name again for me one more time? Siobhan. Siobhan. Okay, that's good. Thank you for coming and attending today. And there's Tomas. Good morning. Good afternoon, Tomas. Good morning, Brett. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. And good morning to Cheryl as well. Oh, good morning, Cheryl. Hi. I'm just staying for a few minutes. I wanted to get an idea of what you're talking about, and then I'm back to all my workload. But thank you for having me. Yes. Well, thank you for coming. I'm just going to go off camera because my Wi-Fi is not the best, but I'm going to start with the live stream in a couple of minutes. Yeah, okay. You let me know when that's up, and we'll um, I'll start with my uh, with my intro here. Thank you, Thomas. Mm -hmm. Sure. Mm. Brett, could you give me the host permissions, please? Oh, sure. Did you get that? Uh, not yet. I'm hitting the make host on the... Uh... The participants? Yeah. Okay. Is you not getting that? No. But let me just try to log in with different account. I'll be back okay. in a second. Sure. Randy, you could probably start with some of the housekeeping here while Tomez is doing that. Okay. Okay. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good day, 
um, depending on wherever you are in the world. Thank you so much for um, coming and attending today. And I'm going to be posting our um, code of conduct uh, in the chat, as well as our antitrust policy. Okay, statement. Uh, also, along with, we ask that if you could please follow us on LinkedIn. So I will post that link as well. And uh, also you can follow us on Discord as well. Um, shall I explain about the um, the drawing now, Brett? Or yeah, we you go. No, you go ahead. To introduce okay. that. Okay. Two participants in today's Zoom event will be selected to receive a autographed copy of Karen Kilmore's recent published book, Blockchain Tethered AI. Another five uh, participants will receive a PDF version of this must read. So that we have your consent and contact information, those who are interested in the drawing, um, please use the Zoom chat and send a direct message to me, Randy Givens, with your name and email address. I will add your name to the list. In the coming days, we will use artificial intelligence to select seven winners and you will be notified by email. The list and associated names are will be used for will not be used for any other purpose. And Brett, that's all that I have for housekeeping. That's excellent. Thank you very much, Randy. I uh, give uh, Tomas a. Uh, I still I gave that. It asked me if I wanted to give you permission. I answered yes. But we're going to. Uh, I'm recording it here now. Yeah, maybe that's the problem, Brett. Maybe if that's the case, I'll keep trying, and if not, I'll just upload it later, so it's still on YouTube. Okay, that's great. Yeah. Thank you so much. Excellent. Sure. Okay, everyone, welcome. Thank you, Randy, for that. And uh, hello and good day to everyone. Today, we're going to delve into the hot button issue of artificial intelligence as it relates to the entertainment industry. It's a good time to discuss the problem and any possible solutions we can arrive at in the future. Uh, I think it's, uh, um, it's a good time to discuss uh, uh, how we could help the entertainment industry from uh, our hyperledger perspective. By the looks of things, uh, with the writers and actors on the strike, we could be out of movie and TV content for a while. For some, that means we'd actually have to talk to each other after dinner. It could be a start of something good, uh, who knows? But uh, uh, today we're here to discuss how media and entertainment can build trust in AI using blockchain. Artificial intelligence has been used in the entertainment industry for some time, in animation, special effects, production, etc. AI has been adopted the same way other technologies are adopted and used to bring efficiencies to the business side of Hollywood. The current Hollywood writer's strike is about a number of things. One is protection from AI and its potential to replace jobs. Some of the concerns that industry members have with AI or that they may lose control of their likenesses or share credit or lose credit to machines. In some ways, these writers' concerns exist outside of AI, as well as protections exist for intellectual property rights now. These topics go beyond the scope of our talk today, but we'll pick up the IP aspect in the near future. So how does AI feel about its reputation as a big meanie and the disruptor of all things. Well, we decided to ask AI directly about whether 
the entertainment industry should be concerned about it. Not surprisingly, AI was not shy about warning us mortals. It replied, yes, the entertainment industry should indeed be concerned with the advancements in artificial intelligence. AI has the potential to impact various aspects of the industry in both positive and potentially disruptive ways. AI gave us eight pretty good detailed pointers on where we should expect disruption. I won't give you the details of all of them, but here are their headings. Content creation and automation. We know about that. That's a big topic right now with the Writers Guild. Personalized content delivery. This is the studio. They're going to be uh, benefiting from that if they're not already, which they probably are already. Data-driven insights. Again, this is uh, information that's available uh, within seconds of, uh, of uh, any online streaming activity, et cetera. Virtual and augmented reality. This is obviously for production. Copyright and ownership, a big issue right now. IP rights, et cetera. Ethical considerations, another big issue. Job disruption and innovation and creativity. We know that uh, AI is going to help writers in some ways. It's going to help all participants in the entertainment industry. Um, but can we actually harness it? and protect, it, uh, protect the industry from its, uh, from its evils. Uh, then we decided to pull one of the smartest in the AI industry and one that we could actually have a human-like conversation with. And that's uh, our friend, Karen Kilroy. Karen is an AI researcher, author of a number of blockchain books, a full stack AI and blockchain developer, an IBM and AI champion, and I won't go too far back, but to demonstrate how connected Karen is to the industry, she led the team that won the 2017 IBM Watson Build. Karen Kilroy's most, rec most recent book, Blockchain Tether AI, is what some participants today will receive. Um, I think uh, we're, uh, if you want to participate in this, and from a privacy perspective, we're going to ask that you send your name and your email address to directly to uh, Randy Givens on the chat and that will give us a uh, uh, that will give us the opportunity to contact you or we're going to run your uh, run your names through uh, AI and uh, have them select the uh, the winners here so hello Karen it's good to see you again it's great to see you too Brett thank you for having me well, we're we're uh, we're all wondering just uh, how we're all all of us, including all of Hollywood right now, are wondering how um, how we can get uh, uh, how we can get AI to work for us um, in the, the how how the entertainment industry can get AI to work for them. So tell us a little bit about your book, Blockchain Tethered AI, why you wrote it, and what it's all about. Sure. Um, blockchain tethered AI. Um, what it involves is making AI uh, and machine learning so it's trackable and traceable. So there's no mystery as to what went in it or uh, or where it came from. And and what we do is we uh, break it down into each element of uh, of of what creates the artificial intelligence and machine learning, uh, all the data, all the algorithms, all the people that are involved. And we make sure that there's identities that, can, that are traceable and that then there is a tamper evident audit trail. And that's where Hyperledger Fabric comes in uh, because anything that is done uh, through the, uh, through through treating the uh, the workings of AI as a supply chain also leaves a trail on Hyperledger Fabric. That's very good. What um, the uh, and we happen to have also uh, one of the developers from the Hyperledger Fabric team, Janish. Uh, would you like to say hello? And could you give us a brief description on how difficult the challenge? this has become in your view as a developer, uh, how uh, um, on the, the building of uh, fabric, Hyperledger Fabric and its application to AI. Go ahead, Janish. 
Yeah, hello everyone. Uh, so uh, I've been uh, working on this Hyperledger, like it's been four, four years plus working in the Hyperledger uh, Foundation. Uh, so mostly I've been working on this Hyperledger fabric and uh, working with this uh, Hyperledger fabric with AI, uh, it has been a challenging one and it was also a most exciting uh, uh, journey. Uh, working with the, uh, on this BTA project, uh, so <laughs> yeah, we have uh, uh, we have carried out like different uh, 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 different. Uh, there were different challenges that we had faced, and we uh, we used uh, by the help of Karen and other our, our teams, uh, we managed to uh, get this uh, uh, blockchain uh, and uh, with the AI. Excellent. And are you having fun with that? Yeah. Yeah. It's quite a, 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 a lot of things to learn. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. Thank you, Janish. Yeah, thanks. Karen, the, um, in your book, um, how did you, why did you choose Hyperledger Fabric as your blockchain platform? I became familiar with Hyperledger Fabric um, way back in 2017, right? When I started learning about AI, it was kind of both things at the same time. I was uh, going to uh, Mark Anthony Morris's meetups in Austin, uh, which were excellent. And uh, and so anyway, I, I learned about it then. And we have been using Hyperledger Fabric uh, at Kilroy Blockchain uh, for uh, quite a few years, ever since then, really. And, uh, and we have a few uh, applications that are in production that use Hyperledger Fabric uh, They uh, for schools. We have Flow, which is a, um, a forms uh, management system for, for K-12 schools. And then we also have Casey, which is a behavior intervention uh, system for K-12 schools. And both of those systems use Hyperledger Fabric uh, to leave an audit trail. And so we've been using it for years and uh, knock on wood, we've never had a hiccup. And so, you know, even though we, we may have had other, uh, even other variations of Hyperledger products that maybe might've been a better fit. It wasn't where our team was so small. Um, we wanted to take what we knew worked and, and implement that alongside AI. Excellent. Karen, the um, the entertainment industry wants to put guardrails on AI. Will they be able to put a saddle on this bucking bronco, or will their efforts stifle innovation? What do you think about that? Well, I think that um, maybe um, you know, kind of think about it differently than the old ways of having to watch for your thing, your uh, your rights to be violated, and then to chase after them because. Um, I don't know. I had a very good friend named Steve Popovich, who was a record. Uh, he was a record comp industry executive um, who uh, who went to court with Sony Music for years and years uh, to try to get his rights for uh, Meatloaf Bad Out of Hell. And uh, Meatloaf also went to court. But long story short, he died before he got anything. And uh, even though it was clearly his rights were violated. And so uh, to me, that's not the answer. Litigation isn't the answer. Instead, I believe it's time to really flip the script and make it so the um, the creatives, the um, the writers, the actors, the, the producers, the musicians own their own digital likeness and, and, and productions. They own their own AI. And then they decide what the distributors uh, get paid and the and the brands, the legacy brands, if they need to use those. And I think something like Hyperledger Fabric is just so solid and reliable. It can actually, you know, be used as a as as a way to 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 keep track of who owns what, who who has uh, what kind of share, uh, who has what kind of royalties coming to them. Uh, really, the whole thing. Uh, and you know, kind of, I envision even performers having wallets with their with their property in it that shows what they have and and what percentage they have and what money they have coming. 
That's interesting. You have a uh, you have an effort ongoing for South by Southwest. How is that project going? Oh, that's really a lot of fun. Uh, we are uh, in competition for a spot to present at South by Southwest. And I actually have a few of my fellow presenters on the line here, uh, Ethan Q and uh, and Orson Weems. And uh, I'm not sure if Melissa Taylor is on too, but uh, I know Ethan and Orson are on here. Uh, and um, and what we've done is we've we've gotten together here in Northwest Arkansas. Um, Orson is uh, is from the uh, music initiative, uh, the music education initiative, and uh, and uh, that's a nonprofit. I met Orson because he was out teaching people. Hey, you know, there's all these uh, productions and there's nobody to do the work. So he was out uh, teaching. And then Ethan is a senior data scientist from Walmart. And uh, and Melissa Taylor is a um, she's the manager of the Center for Innovation at the Fayetteville Public Library. And so we have put our heads together and we're trying to figure out how to flip the script and how to make this all work. Um, we've already done a series of workshops to get some community input on how creators might get paid for their work in advance. But um, but what we hope to do is take this workshop to South by Southwest and really get some uh, public participation and in, in figuring out exactly how this needs to work. Well, what's it looking like? Are you getting the votes you need to uh, to move it forward? I think so. We're hovering. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure that the page rank shows you where you're at, but we do pop up to the top once in a while. And oh, good. Uh, also good. We have really good LinkedIn shares. Uh, I noticed we've had like 85 or so LinkedIn shares. And that's one thing we can see is that number. But um, uh, maybe one of my colleagues might throw that link into the chat so people know how to vote for us on South by Southwest. That would be fine. I that uh, throw that in there and let's um, let's see if we can't uh, if we can't get you some votes. I'm interested in um, in moving this discussion to uh, um, what you what 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 the building blocks would look like for us to get blockchain uh, to address the entertainment industry concerns and. Uh, um, we have, so from a technological perspective, understanding how blockchain works, we, we, we're using data. So we have um, um, acoustic and video fingerprinting, which is already used in, 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 in the industry. But um, in terms of satisfying the needs of, of writers and actors who are concerned about AI, duplicating their works or AI expanding on their works. Um, using hashing, uh, perceptual hashing, uh, which is a, a fingerprinting algorithm, and uh, um, also cryptographic hashing, which is to identifies exact matches, perceptual hashing does uh, matches closely to uh, what some type of media or audio might be. What are your thoughts on how we could build something using Hyperledger, uh, um, in, in using this data that can get uh, created uh, by uh, the fingerprinting process, as well as how do you think it might benefit actors and um, uh, writers, et cetera? You think that might allevi uh, uh, alleviate some of their concerns, at least. Your thoughts on that? Um, sure. Um, it's, it's possible, um, to, uh, not only identify where the, um, where the data comes from, but also identify it after it's out in the wild. And, uh, and there are organizations, uh, led by C2PA, uh, that it's a big, it was started with by, uh, started during the mis big misinformation, uh, surge during the political campaigns a few years back, where a bunch of of organizations got together and they uh, and they came up with standards for identifying uh, misinformation and faked content. And these are big organizations like BBC. 
and uh, and Microsoft and uh, uh, and then there's a smaller implementation called the uh, CAI, which is the Content Authenticity uh, Initiative, and uh, and that actually allows the signing of files, and so uh, and the claiming of credentials within individual files. So let's say someone uses an AI to generate something and it has uh, you know, particular attributes with it, then those attributes can actually be stamped into the end product. Uh, and so when it is run through a verifier, you can just see who owns, owns it and trace it back. So that's one thing that can be done. And see then when you combine something like that with, with blockchain, then you make sure that it's tamper evident. And that no one has, uh, you know, changed the signatures on the files, or or you can at least go back and say, look, this was signed uh, at this particular point. Oh, do you think there's any progress being made on the uh, on the the IP rights to any um, AI generated content? My understanding is that uh, they, there there is no copyright. It can't be copyrighted. What What is your understanding of that? Uh, so AI generates content, and mm -hmm. there's no co there's no copyright to it. So if a if I if AI yeah. generates content based on someone else's work, would that not? And I know you're not a lawyer, but just your exposure to AI, that content would that not fall back to, into the domain of the original content creator, in your view? I don't, I think copyrights are just going to be turned on their ear um, because I think that it's, it's, you know, back to my point about my friend, Steve Popovich, you know, copyright implies that you're going to try to litigate to me um, as opposed to just um, making sure that uh, the the ownership and the direct payment always goes to the artist and, and, uh, I guess, I guess what, you know, I lost my point of what I was going to exactly say about it because somebody started mowing outside, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but the point is uh, really that uh, it's all needs to be reexamined because uh, you, you can't tell who made something. It's like having soup. And, and, you know, figuring out who grew the cucumbers or the, who grew the zucchini that went into it, you know, it's, it's going to be kind of impossible after the fact for everybody to get paid for the produce that went into the soup. And so it's got to all be switched around to where people uh, get their compensation up front and, and it's all established up front as far as how people are going to get paid. And your model uh, flipped the script. What are you changing about the um, the uh, compensation side of things? Well, what we're hoping to do is develop a way for um, for everyone to collaborate on their own. So, uh, so artists, uh, musicians, uh, film you know filmmakers, uh, videographers, scriptwriters, everyone can come together and say we want to make a production. Uh, well, I think one of the big uh, mistakes that the studios made were getting rid of their physical studios, getting rid of their their physical. Uh, you know, if you if you I know you can watch on YouTube, you can see all those sets where like Bewitched and every you know everything in the whole world was ever filmed. They're they're tearing that down and they're putting up big sound stages there instead, and that's so they can produce things digitally. Well, if they can produce things digitally that way anybody can. So it's it's really just a matter of uh, of being able to um, uh, put the right people together and the right technologies and the you know and then then cemented in a way where you have people that don't already really know each other or trust each other can actually trust one another. And I believe that they can form new brands. And uh, and they may need to include the legacy brands for certain things, but I think that the old brands may be a thing of the past and that the stage is right for new brands. And I believe that they could actually own their AI. And I'm so sorry, I got to put you on hold because the person cutting the grass needs me to get my dog. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Uh, go right ahead, go right ahead. That's, uh, that's very interesting. The uh... Karen's um, effort to uh, 
put on a presentation at uh, South by Southwest uh, should be good. I don't know if we got to let me see if I can dig up the um, did, we, did we get that in the chat? Did anyone get that in the chat? Um, yeah. Yes, Brett, it's in the chat. Is it in the chat? OK, OK. Mm -hmm. So spend some uh, spend some time. Uh, spend some time looking, having a look at that, everyone. Uh, we're going to uh, uh, talk about uh, at some point in uh, in this discussion now, uh, you know, what are what the next steps could be towards developing a, uh, a starting the development of a uh, of a, uh, um, a, a project that uh, that could be of benefit to the entertainment industry and seeing if uh, if uh, they say. Actra, Aftra, and uh, the Writers Guild would be interested in possibly participating. Karen, you get you got your dog okay? I do, and he's back. And uh, you see, my plan was to put the dog outside so he didn't bark. But uh, apparently, the best laid plans, you know, <laughs> didn't know the lawn mowing person was coming. <laughs> of course, of course, of course. So we're we're. We definitely want to see what uh, what can come of the of this AI blockchain marriage, and um, what um, where do you think we could start in terms of developing something that uh, is uh, uh, is compatible to the needs of the people that are currently on strike? There's not going to be any way they can put guardrails on this AI, is there? I really don't think so. Um, because the problem is, is they're going to be using this for hundreds and hundreds of years. And we only live so long. And, you know, even if it passes on to our kids, you know, who wants to give your kids a lawsuit? Um, you know, that was one, some of the words that Steve Popovich told me. He said, Karen, never, never get involved in a lawsuit because it'll kill you. He says, don't, don't do it. Think of a different way. So anyway, um, so, you know, I think the very first place to start is with design thinking uh, sessions. And I don't know, are, are you familiar with that term, Brett? It's, it's, um, it involves a, a holding like a group of workshops that are really focused on the uh, on the person who would be participating. So we would focus on the uh, on the on the writers and the actors and the and the people writing the soundtracks and the you know all the supporting crew, and 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 talk with each of them and and really get them involved in designing the system, and uh, and then when you're finished with the design thinking type workshop or session, uh, you know, probably be a series of weeks, uh, then you have a requirements document when you come out and then you can hand it to someone like Janish or Ethan and say, here, this is the requirements for the, uh, for the system that we need. That's interesting. Um, that's something that we should start and we should, we should commit to starting that uh, even today and possibly invite some of the people that are attending here and some of the people that are going to uh, that are going to see the, the video of this. So um, uh, I, I would uh, I would ask anyone that's on here if uh, there is a uh, if there is an opportunity for you guys to get involved, then please uh, put your name up in the chat. We'll have all of the information that we can uh, call on later and get a hold of you and see what, uh, put something together with Karen and we'll, and we'll start building a group. We have some questions in the chat here. I don't know, let me see what, uh, okay. Uh, this is from, oh, um, I'm sorry, Savayan, Savayan? <laughs> you Savayan. know who you Savon, yeah, you know, yeah, there you go. Would the people using the material be the ones to pay, or would everything be a subscription based and percentage go to the artists on a platform? For example, Karen, Did what you is your in, would the people using the material be the ones to pay? I guess that's uh, Siobhan, I, is that 
Yeah, go ahead. Can I, I can clarify. Yeah, so, so I'm wondering, because you were talking about how, you know, blockchain will track the process. So we know who get like pays for say, material being like, say it's artist music. Um, would that then through the platform you guys are developing to track that, would it be like big corporations are paying for it? Or if I wanted to do a music video that I created with AI using Eminem, it would track that eventually I got Eminem. So I would pay a portion to create that video. Or would it be like how a lot of AI has subscription base now? It would just be if you're an artist on that platform and you're using the AI, then it would be a percentage goes to you. I mean, it could be that um, the that I think the big win is for uh, artists to work directly with the consumer, uh, because remember, the consumer is going to be generating things based on what they want. Like I might see a music video with my dog in it, you know, because that's really going to be what gets me happy or whatever, you know. But uh, but so so those the real gold, though, like if I've said nothing else that matters take this as, as a takeaway. The real goal is, are those consumer statistics. That's the data. That's what they're all after. That's why they're all in business is to get, and by them, I mean the distributors, the, the studios, everybody that's working with these technologies. That's the nugget is the, is the behavior data. What do people buy? What do people do? When do they watch? When do they, you know, what combinations of things do they see? So I think that when the artists start to own that data, even a fractional share based on, you know, something that's a collaborative effort, that's when you're going to really make money because then you can market that data in addition to marketing your creation. It could be that the marketing of the data will make it so you can give the creations away to the consumer for free. And it could be there's that much money in it. But uh, but I think that's the big, that's when they shuffle everything around on the table, the shell game, and you don't know where the P went. You know, that's, that's one of the big secrets is that data. They don't ever talk about it, but that's really the valuable thing. And I'll give you another example. When they put scooters everywhere, Remember scooters, scooters everywhere. That was nothing to do with hoping people had a better time getting around. That was everything to do with tracking where people were going. And then they would make deals with the governments to share that data. It was all about data, nothing about scooters. So, so, so that's how big, like data is the new gold. Good point. Uh, go ahead, uh, Sandy, you're there. Yeah, can you hear me okay? We can hear you fine. Oh, well, again, you? Uh, I'm good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, question for Karen. So, I think just to actually chime in on uh, uh, the question from Siobhan, uh and and sorry if I'm butchering your name too. Uh, so, I think as a follow up uh, question on that point. So, Karen, the question I have is basically uh, I know there have been a, a multitude of other similar projects uh, like in, in different industries. And I guess where we fall short on a bunch of things is uh, for any of the, pro like, like, like you said, think product, think design, of which I, of course, I agree with. Um, and, and I guess why some of these products actually don't really end up being super successful is if the market isn't there, right? And, and I guess the question then becomes that, uh, so, so that's where this is, uh, I think this is a follow up on uh, uh, Swan's question this day. Like how, so so you could actually have a product which basically says, okay, well, every bit that comes in, whether that's data or that's the original production is going to be, uh, you know, uh, it's going to have some sort, sort of a traceability there, right? But then the question becomes, uh, like, do you have some sort of a market economics or, or market dynamics in place? And are you actually, as a, as a part of, uh, you know, uh, promoting this product, working, even more than just technology, working on the logistics side of the product to uh, get the buy-in from uh, different stakeholders. Because unless you have that buy-in and unless you have the, the consumer and the producer side of the market, uh, things would be out of balance. And when things go out of balance, they don't really go forward. Yeah, I mean, I, I, agree, with, um, I agree with all of that. You know, I've I've run a company for a lot of years and I know it's really hard to get buy-in and attraction. And especially if you're outside of the 
uh, of the Silicon Valley inner circle and you're not going to get millions of dollars. And but what I believe is that businesses can be run the old way with customers. And uh, and it would seem to me that the star power behind this, if 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 the industry does decide to go this way, and I say if because it's really the industry's decision. You know, if they decide to go this way, then it's their own star power that's going to make it win uh, because people are going to want to see things that they are involved in, not, you know, some AI generated character that has nothing to do with with anybody that they know and like. So I think that, um, you know, this is the kind of thing that the. Um, I don't see this as some big outside company having a project, I see this more as a collaborative effort and uh, a way to bring together a marketplace of a lot of smaller uh, uh, companies and someone like Hyperledger can uh, can kind of set the the infrastructure for that. So uh, and then the other thing I would address that you said, uh, you mentioned market dynamics and, and the ability to catch on. And and I think that's all tied in with with um, with connecting to existing efforts. Uh, like I mentioned, the uh, the content authenticity efforts aren't new, and they aren't they weren't even for AI. Uh, they go back to uh, being able to uh, tell whether something was fake, like you know whether you Photoshop someone in that didn't that wasn't there. Um, and uh, but they're they're perfectly applicable to AI. And so the fact that those standards have been around for several years and that they're evolving and that that they're very active. Uh, makes me have hope that this is is solvable. Agree. I hope- uh, well, yeah. <laughs> no, thanks. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Karen. I I agree. I think CI, uh, like like for example, from Adobe and a bunch of other folks, uh, they've been working on to this. Uh, like like you said, uh, it, it's been also like like in the spy circles of could see something is authentic or not. So that's been out there for quite some time. Uh, I I guess just to if I may add up on my question is that like. I guess what I'm wondering is that, see, uh, the only way uh, you can kind of like, I mean, I could be wrong on this, but my thought process is that, uh, let's say if you if you're to if you try to make some sort of a little production uh, or like a movie or something, and you need to use assets like the the video assets, the audio assets, or anything, right? And let's say it becomes a norm mm-hmm. that you uh, you wouldn't be able to sell your production. Uh, to any other distributors, unless you can prove authenticity of uh, of the content that you used, then the owner starts to fall on the on the producers to make sure they're taking authentic content, right? But unless we have that point, anybody can just use anything and says, okay, well, I got something cool. Yes, it's my real dog, but who proves that it's my real dog or is, is the real, you know, uh, uh, whatever, like JLO? Uh, like they can basically say, oh, yes, like I got the real JLO video here. Uh, it, it may be a completely fake version of JLO, right? So so uh, the point then becomes that, like, I think that's where I was talking about the market dynamics and, and the demand and, and, you know, requirement balance where if you have that balance where you say, hey, uh, if you can somehow, even by grassroots efforts, enforce that uh, the only way, uh, you know, uh, people can sell things. And, and then it's, it's almost like saying, you know, like like these days, uh, people like like I work for a bank and people actually take very serious, uh, uh, people make really serious efforts to make sure all the software running in their shops is fully authentic. Because if they don't do that, we can get fined for millions of dollars. So like in a few years ago, like anybody could grab a copy of Microsoft Office uh, or do anything else. But uh, nowadays people don't do this because no, they know there's uh, you know downside to using, uh, you know, uh, uh, like a, uh, like like a freeware version or like a hack version, right? So so that's where I'm kind of coming to. So I, I guess basically yes, the product design and and the actual technical implementation is absolutely important because unless you have a solid product, uh, you know you can't really make it useful. But at the same time, unless uh, their efforts to enforce uh, the the use of the product in such a way that you know like like uh, unless you have uh, you know, like authenticate, uh, authentic uh, content, you cannot really sell your content. Yeah, there's also ways that, you know, I mentioned the the credit claims that are being done, the CAI 
credit claims. There's also ways to flag files as do not use. Uh, you know, do not include in uh, training data. But I, you know, my answer to that would be all that is being worked on. Um, the, you know, the the companies, I believe that are serving out this content don't want uh, liability either, you know? So I think that the the traceability will end up winning. That's where, uh, uh, and Sandy and uh, Karen, is that not where we get uh... Some fingerprinting, acoustic and video and watermarking and all that sort of stuff that can protect the uh, the product, which and the ownership of that product. The issue becomes what when AI is recreating that product, can we get can we find a way to ensure using uh, the perpetual uh, perceptual hashing, which means that the the, the media can be identified if it's closely resembling any previous watermarked or fingerprinted media, audio or uh, um, any kind of media. So there's a lot that we can do using blockchain once the product is, uh, is run through. Uh, the original works are, are watermarked and fingerprinted. That uh, industry participant, be it a writer or an actor, now has some tools that they can use to help them identify who's messing with their with their stuff. I guess is maybe the simple way to put it. Siobhan, you have a you have a question. Go ahead. Hi. Yeah. Thanks again. Uh, I'm sorry. This is newer for me. I like love using AI, so I'm on the user end of it. So I've heard about a lot of lawsuits and stuff starting though because of like people using content and it's like you know, then the artists miss out and stuff. So I'm curious about the actual, like, I guess, the logistics of it. Um, so if you're, if you guys have designed the software that can track, like the blockchain that can track it, would it be the type of thing if it's with artists, like they go to their producer and their producer would come to you and then get set up with their own specific, that's where they get their wallet with all their information on it. And then if anyone wants to use their content or use, it for any purpose, it'd be almost like the producer and the blockchain would kind of work together. And that would be all through that. Like, is that, I'm just curious about the tracking and all that. Yes, that's definitely one way it could work. And see, there's, um, what goes around the blockchain is normal software. So it's like what I would call a workflow system where, you, you know, one thing goes to another, to another, and then there's agreements. There can be contracts that are coded into the workflow software. So, you know, when certain conditions are met, payment can be released, um, all that can happen. And what the blockchain gives it is, is a, an, a, a tamper evident audit trail. So if anyone ever tries to go back and cook the books, which, you know, I'm sure that they probably, that probably happens a lot. Where someone goes, oh, you know, we, we, we didn't mean to pay them this much, you know, we better fix that. And, and, but they can't touch it without leaving a trail. And so that's what you want to do is set it. So the critical touch points, if they touch anything that's important, it leaves a trail. And so uh, anyone can always go back and look because any a blockchain never gets uh, the cells or the, the blocks in the blockchain never get deleted. So they're, they're just always there. And uh, even when some information changes, it just posts another block. So an auditor can always go back and figure it out. Okay, so could you actually connect the software to a platform like ChatGPT if ChatGPT wanted to take that on? So then every time someone prompts anything, it's always just tracking it or like, I don't know if ChatGPT yes. already has that, but okay, that's very cool. Yeah, yeah, yep. You can connect anything to blockchain. Yeah, that's very cool. Thank you, Karen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, uh, the, the question, uh, Siobhan, about the wallet and uh, would the wallet be the permission touch point for a creator to release that product is a very interesting concept. I mean, we're not talking about in this particular meeting today, we're not talking about current existing technology in blockchain with Hyperledger or any public or private blockchain, permission blockchain. We're talking about what we can do 
And that is a very good point. And that is something that you could have multiple ways of a creator or an author or something who's giving permission to use a particular asset that they have and having having it come from a wallet uh, using keys, uh, you, you know, using the public uh, private key uh, technology, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, I like that. Good, uh, good point. Siobhan, good, good stuff. Uh, we've got a question here from Cheryl Grossman. Cheryl, thank you. Um, I'm uh, reading this. So far, I've seen a good use case for the music industry. There have been odd initiatives for TV and film refinancing, but they haven't worked out yet. Can you see any use cases for film and television? Cheryl, if you're still there, can you, um, do you mean that, uh, I think Cheryl's gone. But uh, for the purposes of, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I think I don't. I'm not sure what the question is relating to. If it's a matter of uh, of uh, payments or financing, um, the music industry has, uh, in in some cases, tried. In fact, with Hyperledger back in I believe 2017, IBM was deeply involved with. Uh, PRS and some of the major music uh, distributors, and uh, they uh, were uh, working to build a Hyperledger fabric blockchain that would track all of the um, the music uh, uh, metadata uh, against ownership. And that, that project was dropped, and I don't know why, but it was. And I've asked some people within Hyperledger um, and some IBMers, if they could tell me why, and no one seems to know why. But uh, the music industry is a mess from a from a from a um, uh, the perspective of payments and uh, residuals and uh, things of that nature. There's millions of dollars sitting in in vacant accounts, waiting to find out who owns these rights. These uh, so that's something that certainly. Uh, with the cooperation of the industry, it can get fixed, but whether the industry will cooperate is another story altogether. But uh, so that is, um, um, I know that that is in the in the music industry, but I think that that this can be payments uh, or uh, investment in film and television. A lot of it is is government driven. A lot of it is uh, tax credit driven, which means that accounting is a very critical component to it. So there is definitely a use case for blockchain in that side of it. And that's in fact something that I'm a pet project of mine for the last couple of years to build out a, uh, a um, uh, blockchain, a Hyperledger fabric block, um, based production kit out of the, uh, that you could then open and close a, a, a corporation in terms of uh, building a film production or series or whatever. And then closing it at the end, and then using all the same uh, components, companies that have been identified, and, and, and uh, <clears throat> you know, to, to to just join you right back into a new production. So, so that's something that uh, Cheryl is uh, maybe uh, maybe helpful to that question that you had. If I could add to that, yeah, go right uh, ahead. That really fits the whole multimodal type aspect too. Uh, you know, for production. Uh, maybe even if a production you had its own blockchain and that always travels with that particular piece of, of production, you know, it could be that that production will be turned into a game or it'll be turned into a, uh, um, you know, a, 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 a screenplay or a book or, a, you know, it, it could be in, it turned into any number of things. Um, it could be turned into something that we're not even thinking about yet, but, uh, but the, uh, there's all kinds of things that can happen with this uh, that that wouldn't be in the past because it's, it's generative. So so someone could say, I like this particular show, make it a game, you know, or uh, or make this a social a social experience where I'm chatting with the show and I actually get to talk to the actors and, you know, but it's all pretend. And, and uh, so that whole thing, they call it multimodal where there's all different kinds of, of aspects involved with a production. So I just thought I'd throw that out there and say, I think that kind of fits with what you just described. Oh, 
Uh oh, I lost your audio. That was my fault. The question from iPhone here could the emergence of AI imply a reduction in demand for highly skilled writers or creators, thereby potentially enabling anyone to assume the role of a creator or writer, thanks to the capabilities AI introduces? Well, I'm going to, before you jump in there, Karen. I'm just going to add my point about the fingerprinting and about the about the uh, uh, the fact that uh, you can actually use blockchain to prove you own a product, and then you can use AI to determine whether or not that product is being uh, uh, we'll, we'll use the word uh, fraudulently exploited. So that's mm -hmm. uh, that's my one of one of the responses to iPhone's question. But the uh, the the important thing is that is that blockchain shows who owns the product, and blockchain can show who owns a product that's similar to that product, and prove that. And there's obviously some other legal implications and costs associated with that. Go ahead, Karen. What are your thoughts on that? Oh no, that's okay. My my first thought was that over time the quality will dilute. If you don't have real writers and, and real artists and real creative people, it's already been proven that the drift in AI makes it so then the quality starts to drop. And uh, and I, I really do think that most of the content in the world isn't already in AI. It's 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 in our heads. It's all over our studios. You know, it's laying around on the floor. It's you know, it's yet to be introduced. So um, that's why I was thinking that, you know, uh, it's time to really change the way it's all done and, and just turn it all around. So the ownership stays with the people who own their creativity and the terms are, are set up front before you even give them the content. Um, so, um, so it, to answer the question, yes, it is true right now today, you can sit down and you can, uh, you can write amazing things and do amazing artwork. Just like, uh, you know, I like to, I like Jean-Michel Basquiat. And that has been one of my big things I've played with on Dali. And it's astounding how well it does his style. And, uh, but, you know, of course he does, he'll never see a penny nor will his estate. Um, but, but that isn't going to last that way without more content, more real content. It'll dilute. That is uh, something that I've come to learn from the, uh, from this industry that, for sure, AI has only got uh, can only last for so long. And from a creative perspective, it's got to be built on top of the real human thinking, the real human participation. Which is why I think it's important that uh, it's you can first identify the the fact that it's been a it's a copy or it's a derivative of a human production, and then from there you sort of have to start testing the legal body to uh, and the legislation to figure out whether or not the uh, uh, you can enforce certain rights. So the way things are today isn't necessarily the way things are going to be tomorrow in terms of the legal side of, uh, of intellectual property. So we just have to hope that, uh, um, you know, there's some changes and there's some, there's some real um, progress in terms of, uh, in terms of, making it so that there's fair compensation for everyone. And I, you know, from, from what I've seen with respect to the Writers Guild and the, uh, the actors on strike and some of the things that I've seen from the studios, there really is a huge imbalance. And that's, uh, that's uh, hopefully going to get fixed uh, now. But uh, let's hope that, uh, one, we can spend more time talking at, after dinner than watching movies. And two, yeah. let's... Uh, Let's uh, let's hope that these people that have not been uh, fairly compensated find their find their stride with this uh, with this strike. So, with yeah. that, do we have any other questions in here? It's um, I don't see any others. Any other comments from you folks out there? Great participation. Thank you so much to all of you. And uh, how do we get the tools in front of SAG AFRA? Uh, is what Ethan asked. Yeah, well, that's um, that's something that let's pick that up in our uh, in a in a discussion after this, and let's um, 
Let's hope that everybody who wants a a copy of your book has sent an email into yeah. into into uh, uh, Randy, and uh, we're gonna get uh, we're gonna get a couple of those copies out, and plus the plus the uh, plus the digital PDF copies. So, Karen, it was uh, it's uh, we're up in a couple of minutes here, but uh, do we have any other comments from you on uh, oh? Um, Siobhan, if you want to just send, she should be right in the, um, uh, just send it, just send your contact info, Siobhan, to Randy in the chat here. Just uh, Randy should be in there under Randy Givens, no? Yes, I'm in there. Yeah, you're in there. And then, uh, yeah. there you go. Okay, yeah, if you great. want to do that. Got it. Got it. Thank you, Siobhan. And thank you, everyone, for participating. Karen, any closing comments here? What uh, What's the next thing for us in terms of AI and blockchain? I think that the uh, design thinking sessions, it would be good to hold a, a few official design thinking sessions and get some real input from people because, uh, as was pointed out, you know, you can't just build it and hope people come. Um, it has to be useful to people. And it could be that this could be started very small and tested and then then expanded in a way that makes sense so uh i'm i'm really hopeful and i thank you so much for having having me here today to to talk about this and uh and i look forward to hearing everybody's uh feedback uh you can find me the easiest on linkedin karen kilroy yeah hopefully all you guys can jump on uh, linkedin and uh, follow our uh our uh uh, Hyperledger Media and Entertainment Special Interest Group. And from there, we'll start uh, talking about the design thinking group and uh, make some progress. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Karen, for participating. You're a, you're a, you're a, you're a wonder in the AI world. And uh, <laughs> we'll see you all at our next monthly meeting. Thank Take you care, all everyone. so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Okay, take care.